my topic is uh, the right ventricle in congenital heart disease from imaging to clinical decisions. And um, I don't have any financial relationship. I wish I had, but uh, none to uh, disclose. And uh, what I would like to accomplish in the next uh, 45 minutes or so is to first discuss the developmental, anatomic, and functional considerations of how the right ventricle gets to become what it is. Um, then we'll uh, spend some time discussing imaging the right ventricle, how to choose from a menu of imaging modalities. And finally, uh, I'll give some examples of how uh, data from these imaging studies can be uh, used to inform clinical decision makings. So let's go to the beginning, and uh, I find it helpful to uh, consider the embryology uh, of the uh, heart. And in this case, I'm actually going to begin with developmental considerations. And it is worth noting that the evolution of the cardiovascular system mimics uh, embryogenesis. Um, and if you look at the development of the, or the evolution of the cardiovascular system, the right ventricle has developed approximately 320 million years after the left ventricle. Um, and the right ventricle has developed as a specialized lung pump. You can see here, starting about uh, 500 million years ago, uh, mostly with uh, sea creatures such as fish and similar creatures. If you look at the cardiovascular system, what you'll find um, at the center is a single ventricle that pumps blood through a muscularized outlet that um, pumps is in a peristalsis fashion and supplies both the gills and the body. If you fast forward uh, to about 345 million years uh, before now, um, amphibians started to uh, spend time both uh, inside and outside water. And in those amphibians, you can still find a large single ventricle, uh, one pumping chamber, but the infundibulum, that is that outlet part, the muscularized outlet part, now gets uh, shorter, sits closer to the ventricle, and begins to, uh, you, you start noticing a spiral uh, septum-like pathway within the infundibulum that streams uh, blood to the to the lungs and to the body. Uh, and this is the first evidence of separation between a right and left sides of the circulation. By the time that you get to reptiles that live mostly uh, breathing air and have lungs, uh, by that time, it's the first stage in evolution where one finds vestiges of a right ventricle that is a small chamber with incomplete septum, still there's a large communication between the main pumping chamber, the left uh, ventricle, and now the primitive developing right ventricle, and an infundibulum that now sits over both ventricles. But again, for the first time uh, in uh, reptiles, one can identify a pulmonary, a main pulmonary artery and an aorta. By the time that you get to birds, um, and this is just about 180 between reptiles and amphibians uh, and uh, birds we get to about 800 million years ago, uh, we now have a specialized lung pump uh, to the right of the uh, body pump, which is the, that the body pump is the left ventricle and the lung pump is the right ventricle. And we see the uh, arrangement that we find in mammalians. The only thing about birds, they tend to have a right aortic arch, but otherwise the heart is quite similar to that found in mammalians, including us. So as I said, the embryology of the cardiovascular system uh, parallels the evolution. Uh, it begins as a straight heart tube with one ventricle. Uh, that's gonna be the future left ventricle. 
and a circulation in series. And what ensues is a development from one straight heart cube into a complex system with two parallel circulations with right and left ventricles. And the right ventricle develops from the um, what's been called the bulbous cordis or the conus or infundibulum, which is part of the primitive heart tube. And let me show you kind of a, an artistic rendering of this. This is taken from an um, uh, Harvard Medical School embryology course back in uh, 2005. We are now looking at, a, at, a, at an embryo at about 16 to 18 days of gestational age. We are looking from the, um, from the back. So this is the future head. This is the future um, legs or um, cephalad aspect of the uh, embryo. Uh, and this is the back, left and right. And see what happens. So this is an animation of the uh, process. We start to see blood vessels forming here along the left and right side. We're getting rid of the rest of the uh, embryo, uh, just focusing on the cardiovascular system. And you see these uh, blood vessels fuse in the center, get back the embryo with the developing head right there. We're adding the venous return. These are the aortic arches going in the back of the embryo. And this is where we are. Uh, this is what happens in just those two days during embryogenesis. So now we have a straight heart tube. Let's focus on that. And we are looking from cephalad to caudal. So this is, uh, if you will, uh, in fear, this is uh, future head. We uh, can identify the venous return to the um, straight heart tube. Uh, the confluence of the veins is called the sinus venosus. They uh, become confluent here to form the atrium. We just have one atrium uh, at that stage. It leads to a ventricle. This is going to be the future left ventricle. On top of that sits the infundibulum or bulbous cordis. And uh, above that, uh, you see an artery uh, called truncus arteriosus. And that truncus arteriosus lead to the aortic arch. So let's uh, watch what happens between 18 and 22 days of gestation. This straight heart tube undergoes de-looping, meaning it loops to the right, the dextro. And here we are. This is, again, this is the future atrium. This is the future left ventricle. This is the infundibulum. We still don't have a right ventricle but then the right ventricle will develop right about here in this area, and this will be the future interventricular septum. At this point, there's a wide communication between the left ventricle and the future right ventricle. So now the common atrium has moved uh, to the back. It sits posterior uh, to the ventricle. It connects with the left ventricle. It aligns exclusively with the left ventricle at this stage through the atrioventricular canal. We begin to see the left ventricle uh, anterior and to the left and the future right ventricle here at the base of the infundibulum leading to the truncus arteriosus. So this is uh, how we got to a left ventricle on the left side, a right ventricle on the right side. And let's uh, shift our attention to the anatomy. The left and right ventricles are distinctly different from each other in terms of uh, structure and function. Here's the left ventricle for comparison, and here's the right ventricle. And these are, this is normal uh, anatomy. The left ventricle has uh, a bullet shape or torpedo shape uh, structure. Uh, you can see here a relatively thick, compact layer of myocardium, which is thickest at the base and becomes progressively uh, thin towards the apex. By the way, if you take a strawberry and cut it along its length, you will find exactly the same, um, same observation. I don't know why it is in the strawberry, but at least in the human left ventricle, 
um, this variable thickness cor corresponds to uh, variability in the angle of curvature of the wall. And that has to do with the law of Laplace, which essentially maintains a uniformity in wall tension or in wall stress throughout the left ventricular wall. So the most angulation here at the apex and the least amount of thickness um, in contrast to the base. The mitral valve in the normal left ventricle attaches to two large papillary muscles that do not attach to the septum. Uh, the septum is characterized by a basal portion that has smooth uh, septal surface. All of these are typical characteristics of the left ventricle. The aortic valve here is in fibrous continuity with the mitral valve, and you uh, see no muscular separation between the two. In contrast, the right ventricle is a much more uh, complex structure, uh, from a geometric uh, perspective, you uh, notice that the right ventricle is more trabeculated, thinner, the wall is thinner. The tricuspid valve here have, has multiple attachments to the septum, and you see this thick uh, muscle band along the septum here leading to the pulmonary valve up here, which is separated from the tricuspid valve by this thick uh, rim of tissue, which is the conal or infundibular septum. So marked morphologic differences between the right ventricle and the left ventricle. The normal right ventricle is a bipartite structure comprised of two anatomically distinct chambers, the sinus or the inflow, shown here in this diagram in yellow. This is called the right ventricular sinus. This is, in fact, the pumping portion of the right side of the heart. That, that part is the uh, segment that developed later in evolution, developed later during embryogenesis, uh, and that is the specialized lung pump that um, I uh, described to you uh, earlier. The infundibulum, that part that is a much more ancient component of the cardiovascular system, is seen here in blue. Most people in the field are uh, aware of this distal part of the infundibulum as being infundibulum, but in fact the infundibulum has a proximal part and has its own apex that's uh, separated from the right ventricular apex. Now, for many um, of the cardiologists in the audience, the concept of having the right ventricle uh, being a bipartite structure uh, is, uh, would sound unusual because there's many uh, books and, uh, and it's uh, conventionally taught uh, that the right ventricle comprised of three parts. Um, but I'm happy to uh, either at the end or in private um, go into more detail why this is not uh, quite the case. Certainly from an embryologic perspective, uh, there's strong evidence supporting the concept of bipartite right ventricular structure. Each of these parts, the sinus and the infundibulum, can be further subdivided into two uh, parts that then can be, then, then you end up with four components. The right ventricular sinus, um, one can um, separate the AV canal portion right about here under the septal leaflet of the tricuspid valve. And we are all familiar with that in uh, patients with atrioventricular canal defects. Um, the infundibulum can then be subdivided into proximal infundibulum, I'm sorry, proximal infundibulum here with its own apex and then distal infundibulum, the part that sits just under the pulmonary valve. The right ventricular myocardial architecture is quite distinct as compared with the left ventricle. And uh, the first observation is that right ventricular mass is about one-sixth that of the left ventricular mass. By the way, right ventricular systolic pressure is about one-sixth that of um, systemic pressure as well. Right ventricular myocardial architecture is characterized by a thin 
compact layer. You can see he, you can see it here in this um, low power micrograph. And there are prominent trabeculations with deep recesses. So again, this is just normal anatomy of the uh, right ventricular myocardium. There are four spiraling muscle bundles that encircling both ventricles, forming a single functional unit. Uh, and you, what you see here is a posterior view, and you see here a superior view, and you see these muscle bundles that encircle both ventricles, and then uh, some of these muscle bundles split and then join to form the uh, interventricular septum. And these are all um, important observations in the context of understanding ventricular-ventricular interaction in uh, disease states. Uh, for, ex uh, for example, it's been uh, recognized at the beginning of the 19th century in patients with um, a uh, left ventricular infarction that they can uh, develop right heart failure with peripheral edema, enlarged liver, and ascites, even though they do not have pulmonary edema. And that's, um, that was the first time that the observation of right ventricular failure due to left ventricular failure has been observed. And since then, uh, we have now understand that this goes both ways. And this is part, this is at least part of the underlying um, pathophysiologic explanation for, these, uh, for this phenomenon. Compared with the left ventricle, the fiber orientation in the right ventricular sinus is predominantly longitudinally um, arranged. There's less transmural variations, so the left ventricle is characterized by three layers, um, a circumferential, oblique, and longitudinal layers. Uh, and this is... Um, in the right ventricle, there's mostly two layers, and they're mostly oriented in a longitudinal fashion, which uh, has important implications to how, how the right ventricle functions. The contraction of the right ventricle is, again, uh, distinct from and different from that of the left ventricle. The left ventricle uh, contracts mostly in a ringing uh, fashion, uh, so there's... Um, just like one rings a, a, a piece of cloth uh, with water to get the water out, uh, you see far less of that in the right ventricle. The right ventricle contracts in a peristalsis-like fashion. And you can see here that the sequence of mechanical activation uh, follows the electrical activation. This is just a, a, an electrical uh, mapping of the right ventricle, uh, showing how the uh, wave of electrical activation follows the right ventricle and ends up in the infundibulum. And this is a, a, a project that we did um, now seven, 17 years ago. Uh, uh, but as best I can tell, the results still hold. We used fairly primitive tools at the time, but basically demonstrated that the infundibulum, the outlet part of the right ventricle, contracts approximately 25 to 50 milliseconds uh, late, later than the minimum RV sinus volume. We, uh, since then, uh, have had the opportunity to work with uh, more sophisticated tools, and this is a work that uh, was led by Edith Haber. Um, using myocardial tagging to construct um, three-dimensional uh, displacement and strain maps of, the, of both ventricles, but the work uh, focused on the right ventricle. And you can see here a displacement map of the right ventricle and here a strain map of the right ventricle. And what we have learned from that is that the RV systolic volume decreases due to uh, motion of the free wall towards the septum in this direction. So this would be circumferential shortening. Motion uh, from the base towards the apex, that would be longitudinal shortening. And 
bulging of the septum into the RV cavity, which is mostly done by the left ventricle. Uh, we also learned in some further details that about regional variations uh, that are in fact consistent with fiber orientation. So longitudinal displacement, if you just look at uh, the various regions of the right ventricle and how uh, it moves, the greatest degree of displacement is at the base. And that's a, in fact the part of the heart that exhibits the most amount of displacement, more than the left ventricle. And then there's a gradient of, this, of decreasing degree of displacement towards the apex. However, when you look at strain, specifically longitudinal strain, uh, there's about the same amount of strain in the midsection and in the apex, which is more than the base. So um, with the, the, these were just some of the observations using um, tagging mapping uh, of the right ventricle. We did find that the right ventricle twists uh, about its long axis, but the degree of uh, RV twist specifically angular motion, is less than what is found in the left ventricle. What about right ventricular function? It turns out that it is difficult to apply conventional indices of LV contractility to the uh, RV because of difficulties in identifying and systole. We know when it comes to left ventricular physiology that end systole is a crucially important point in the cardiac cycle. Uh, and that time in the cardiac cycle can be identified uh, in, uh, in using various methods, including in vivo in uh, living individuals. This is much harder uh, on the right side of the heart. And that is because there's continued flow in early diastole uh, in the main pulmonary artery. It's difficult to uh, identify the precise moment where um, the right ventricle reaches and systole. And remember, I just told you that the right ventricle uh, squeezes in a peristalsis-like motion. So uh, it depends what part of the right ventricle you want to uh, identify as ending its contraction. In addition to that, the uh, right ventricle uh, encounters low afterload. There's low pulmonary vascular resistance, high capacitance, there's inertia, pulse wave reflections, all of these uh, combined to make it more difficult to identify the precise time of end systole on the right side of the heart. And we know that RV function depends on LV size and function through shared myofibers, the septum, coronary circulation, and shared pericardial space. So, um, let's just pause here for a moment and summarize what we've learned so far. Uh, we've noted that the right ventricle developed uh, late during evolution as a specialized lung pump. It comprises of two anatomic and functional components, the RV sinus and the infundibulum. Uh, it has complex shape and geometry. It contracts in a peristalsis-like fashion and uh, most of the contraction occurs in a longitudinal um, axis uh, with relatively little twist. And we learned that there is a substantial amount of RV-LV interaction through shared myofibers, pericardium, septum, coronaries, um, and other uh, elements. Moving along. Now we're gonna talk about imaging considerations. So now we're getting into the clinical realm and what we have here is a choice uh, from a menu of um, diagnostic modalities. We have on the right side here, the, modal the various modalities including echocardiography, magnetic resonance imaging, invasive uh, catheterization, CT, and nuclear techniques, that's on one side. On the left side, there's the patient. And we have to consider uh, the specific circumstance of the individual patient when, we, when it comes to tailoring the 
uh, most appropriate imaging modality, we have to consider what the clinical question is. What is the patient's age, body size? Has the patient had previous surgery? Metallic implants, yes, no. Patient cooperation, is the patient able to uh, lie still and cooperate with uh, whatever um, modality or whatever test we are uh, asking the patient to go through? What's the risk and benefits of the um, test, the cost, and local resources? Uh, we were fortunate a couple of years ago to be asked to uh, write this uh, article about multimodality non-invasive imaging for assessment of congenital heart disease. And um, I'm showing you this very uh, busy table, not uh, for the purpose of going through it or uh, noting any specifics, but to show you uh, that, in fact, no, sig no single modality uh, is perfect. No single diagnostic modality can provide you all of the information at a low cost, no radiation, um, and with wide availability to, uh, in, in all centers. So this is the take home from that uh, slide. The bottom line is that no modality is perfect, and the judicious uh, use of complementary techniques, uh, meaning multimodality, uh, imaging uh, is the way to go and that one has to take into account local expertise and access to that particular modality. So let's go through it um, um, in, in a little bit more detail. Uh, when it comes to assessment of the right ventricle, in day-to-day -day clinical practice, what we are uh, talking about is uh, mostly echocardiography and cardiac MRI. We use uh, CT only when MRI is contraindicated or constrained by metallic artifacts. And I just wanted to remind you that exposure to ionizing radiation is associated with increased risk of cancer. It's a, a linear uh, phenomenon, except when it comes to age. This is, a real, this is now a 13-year-old study, but uh, what it does, it highlights the, the age sensitivity uh, or biological sensitivity related to age to exposure to ionizing radiation. So on the y-axis is the percent risk of estimated lifetime attributable risk of fatal cancer in pediatric CT, and this is the age of CT. And oops, I wanted to remind you that the age range that we are talking about in the pediatric population is mostly here. And you can see the exponential rise in risk uh, when it comes to younger patients. The other thing about younger patients is that they often have to undergo multiple tests or they are being followed longitudinally. The right ventricle has to be evaluated more than one time. And of course, the risk of um, exposure to ionizing radiation increases with each examination. So echocardiography is the primary imaging modality. It's essentially extension of the stethoscope. It's a portable, um, modality. You can take it uh, practically everywhere. Uh, it's relatively inexpensive. Excellent that it has ex an excellent diagnostic yield in infants and children. And in fact, uh, when it comes to kind of this age group, we can see almost everything that we need to see. But this is different as patients grow and we take care of uh, a changing population and uh, the majority of patients with congenital heart disease survive to adulthood. And now we are facing with uh, different kind of patients. Their echocardiography is limited by acoustic window. That's the first uh, limitation. The second limitation is acoustic window, as is the third limitation. So we just, it's hard to see the right ventricle because the right ventricle has that complex shape that I discussed earlier, it's not amenable to geometric assumptions. In other words, if you only see part of the right ventricle, you cannot extrapolate to other parts of the chamber. Uh, 
the right ventricle lies right under the sternum, which makes it particularly difficult to uh, visualize in its entirety, um, especially in patients who have undergone prior cardiac surgery and have scars and uh, devices in the heart. And the right ventricle has this uh, peristalsis-like motion with regional variations. So if you assess uh, function at one part of the right ventricle, that doesn't mean that uh, it tells you correctly the uh, function of the other part. When it comes to echocardiography, there are multiple ways in which one can evaluate the right ventricle. There's M mode, 2D, 3D, spectral Doppler, tissue Doppler, more recently speckle tracking. And from each of these techniques, one can uh, derive a whole list of parameters by which the right ventricle can be evaluated. And uh, I'm just showing you this as um, a pretty rich menu of options as far as how one can go about evaluating the right ventricle by echocardiography. A couple of observations about uh, echo evaluation of the right ventricle. Uh, we have learned, uh, using comparison with cardiac MRI, that visual inspection of the right ventricle is highly inaccurate. Um, I'll show you a little bit of data to support that. That we also learned that geometry-based parameters, such as diameters, area, 2D-based volumes, uh, are inaccurate and are not reproducible. 3D-derived uh, RV volumes and injection fractions actually correlate quite well with MRI. There's slight underestimation of uh, end diastolic and end systolic volume, but if you follow the same patient longitudinally, um, that 3D assessment of RV size and function uh, can be helpful by, uh, by 3D, um, but uh, it is its major weakness is its inability to obtain a full data set in about 42% of patients with congenital heart disease. And this is mostly uh, relates to the older patients. Once you get to uh, young adulthood and adults, then the ability to visualize the entire right ventricle by 3D echo uh, is actually not as good as we would like it to be. This is just some data uh, showing the um, observer variability and comparison with MRI, agreement with MRI, when it comes to visual inspection of the right ventricle. So in 26%, the same observer uh, ranked RV function differently by at least one grade. And when it comes to inter-observer uh, variability, uh, that was almost 40% of the observations uh, varied from each other. Uh, this is just the same uh, study uh, showing the very wide um, spread of the difference between uh, echo and MRI assessment of right ventricular ejection fraction. So the confidence limits here are uh, very broad, in fact, plus minus uh, almost 25%. Uh, focusing on uh, echo TAPSI or tricuspid annular plane systolic excursion, excursion, excuse me, uh, is a very popular uh, parameter used uh, mostly in adult uh, cardiology, also in pediatric, but it has been shown to be helpful in patients with uh, pulmonary hypertension, adults with pulmonary hypertension. But there's some data from pediatric pulmonary hypertension showing that it is less useful uh, in terms of risk stratification in, that, uh, in the pediatric population. The TAI index, uh, which is a geo geometry independent parameter, uh, has had a lot of enthusiasm when it was first um, introduced mostly because it is relatively easy to measure. However, um, enthusiasm has receded based on lack of evidence that it's clinically useful in congenital heart disease and weak correlations with cardiac MRI. Uh, and then non-geometric uh, parameters such as the PDT, tissue velocity, strain and strain rate are um, 
helpful in that uh, they are independent of geometric assumptions, but uh, we, this, we, the experience with these parameters is still relatively young, and the threshold values to identify uh, discrimination, uh, discrimination of patients at risk is still uh, hasn't been validated as yet. I will uh, not spend a lot of time on MRI. This is I'm, I'm speaking at a center that has an, an, an outstanding M cardiac MRI program. So I feel like I'm uh, speaking um, uh, to a knowledgeable audience. MRI has uh, many advantages, has some disadvantages. But when it comes to the right ventricle, MRI is particularly helpful in the sense that uh, there's well-established methodology on how to quantify right ventricular size and function. You can get uh, some sophisticated measures of displacement strain, um, uh, either using displacement maps like this one uh, or doing more recently tissue tracking. You can actually uh, take existing data sets of CINE SSFP uh, cardiac MRI and using uh, offline analysis, track the tissue and get um, strain and strain rate measurements in different regions of both left and right ventricles. Uh, you can evaluate scar tissue, as in this patient with repair tetralogy of fallot. You see the uh, bright signal here in the right ventricular outflow tract, consistent with non-viable myocardium. And here's the viable myocardium, is that dark area with no signal. And you can see these intermediate, or areas with intermediate signal in the septal free wall insertions. It is inferior and superior insertions here. Um, more sophisticated analysis uh, that can be done when it comes to the right ventricle is evaluation of uh, strain and flow and uh, the fluid structure interaction is something that uh, we're just now starting to study when it comes to the right ventricle. This is something that's been studied uh, uh, by several groups on the left side of the heart, but very little information on the right side of the heart. Um, we can now uh, measure diffuse myocardial fibrosis, or more specifically, extracellular volume fraction, um, both in the left ventricle, and then um, this is a uh, paper in press uh, showing that this can also be done in the right ventricle. Uh, right here, and this is a way to get in vivo tissue characteristics of the right ventricle. Uh, MRI measurements of the right ventricle are uh, reproducible, especially uh, when it's done uh, by you know, exper in experienced hands, and this is just some data to show uh, reproducibility, reproducibility of measurements of RV volumes, ejection fraction, and mass. It is slightly less reproducible as compared with the left ventricle, but still better than any other alternative that we have in clinical practice. So how do we use all of that information? In, in the field of pediatric cardiology and congenital heart disease, there are many, many circumstances uh, where RV size, function, anatomy, are all highly relevant to managing these patients. And I'm listing on this slide just some of these uh, examples. And just to give you uh, a little bit more in-depth look, uh, I will highlight how these measurements are being used in patients with repair tetralogy of Fallot. This is a congenital heart disease that uh, can now be successfully repaired in the uh, in greater than 99% of patients, the vast majority of whom survive uh, to adolescence and adulthood, uh, but they all have residual hemodynamic and anatomic uh, problems, including pulmonary regurgitation, progressive RV dilatation and dysfunction, tricuspid regurgitation, they have residual lesions, and clinically, um, some of them don't do well, and the proportion of patients who don't do well including uh, uh, 
major arrhythmias and sudden death increases substantially once they reach the third decade of life. And what you find in these patients uh, is electromechanical cardiomyopathy. And I'm just showing you a heart from a patient with repair tetralogy of Fallot who died of a heart failure death. And you can see here the massively enlarged right ventricle, um, severe right ventricular hypertrophy. You see the patches. And uh, this bas patient, patient basically died of cardiomyopathy. Uh, this is the data that demonstrate the point that I made about late accelerated rates of mortality here. And this is morbidity when it comes to arrhythmia burden. And what we have learned that uh, over the past 40 years is that um, there are several risk factors that uh, predict poor outcomes, including history or the age at repair, pri prior palliative shunts, having syncope, various EP character, electrophysiologic characteristics, such as um, wider QRS duration, sustained VT, uh, and hemodynamic sequelae. Uh, up until we are able to measure right ventricular size and function, the most uh, commonly used uh, criteria was QRS duration on the electrocardiogram of 180 milliseconds. So we ask ourselves whether or not cardiac MRI can provide additional benefit in terms of risk stratification. And that's when we uh, initiated the indicator or International Multicenter Tetralogy Resi Registry, uh, which is a study from four large congenital heart centers in Boston, Toronto, London, and Amsterdam. And we uh, aimed at uh, looking at risk factors for hard outcomes in patients with repair tetralogy of Fallot, specifically death and sustained VT. And what we found by multivariable analysis is that QRS duration does predict the outcome, as previously has been shown, but that the ability, that the strength of the model measured by C statistics is actually relatively modest. If you use QRS duration and MRI parameters, then the ability of the model to predict the outcome increases substantially. And you can just see it graphically. On the y-axis is C-index. This is the ability of QRS uh, duration to um, predict the outcome. And here is a combination of MRI parameters alone, RV mass to volume ratio and LV ejection fraction z-score much stronger ability to predict the outcome. And I will uh, just show you this Kaplan-Meier curve to show how the, uh, these MRI parameters are able to predict the outcome. If patients uh, do not have any of the three risk factors noted on the multivariable analysis, they did quite well. Uh, if they had RV hypertrophy alone, uh, they started to show uh, incidence of death and sustained VT. If they had two risk factors, they had more uh, risk. And of course, if they had three risk factors, they separated them and they had a particularly poor uh, outcome. So how can these observations be used to inform clinical decisions in this group of patients? Uh, well, most of the research uh, and publications on the topic have uh, looked at right ventricular and diastolic volume uh, in predicting RV remodeling after pulmonary valve replacement. Uh, we've looked uh, into the topic ourselves and uh, set up uh, criteria that uh, we wanted the right ventricle not only to decrease in size, but also to improve in function. And we found uh, that RV and diastolic volume is not the best uh, marker, but instead RV and systolic volume index greater than uh, 90 milliliter per meter square, having RV dysfunction or QRS duration greater than 160 milliseconds were all predictors of uh, subnormal or, or inadequate remodeling of the right ventricle after pulmonary valve replacement. So this is just a quick look at um, some of the guidelines. This is um, 
from just one uh, set of guidelines that represent the opinion of a single individual as to how to uh, uh, use criteria to send patients for pulmonary valve replacement. And if you notice here, uh, a good chunk of the criteria depend on cardiac MRI findings in patients with repaired tetralogy of flow. So these measure, all of these measurements uh, are uh, being put to use in terms of informing clinical decision making. One can ask, can ECHO be used to guide clinical decision in this group of patients? And the answer to that is yes. Uh, it turns out that Doppler estimation of RV pressure uh, is quite important, and this is uh, work that is now making itself uh, its way through the publication process. Uh, assessment of LV function, which is important in these patients, can be done by ECHO. Um, we are uh, attempting to identify threshold values for RV dilatation and dysfunction by 3D RV volumes, uh, uh, tissue Doppler and strain. Um, which will be especially important uh, in during the first decade of life when we don't want to send patients to MRI because they're unable to cooperate. We don't want to anesthetize them. And they have a low incidence of major adverse outcomes. They tend to do quite well. So ECHO can fill in the gap during the first decade of life. We still have these uh, challenges that I've outlined before. And I will uh, summarize uh, what we've discussed thus far by saying that the right ventricle developed late during evolution as a specialized lung pump. Uh, there are multiple imaging modalities that can be used to assess the right ventricle, but uh, we have to uh, judiciously use ECHO and MRI. ECHO is the dominant tool during the first decade of life. MRI becomes the dominant tool uh, afterwards. CT and invasive imaging only in selective uh, cases. Clinical decisions are dominated by MRI-based measurements of RV volumes, ejection fraction, and mass, although I suspect that in the future we will be increasingly using more sophisticated parameters uh, of the right ventricle. And I wanted to acknowledge uh, members of uh, my uh, group in, uh, at Boston Children's Hospital. And I wanted to thank you for your attention. Thank you very much.